What I love to do is introduce the right people to the right people, assemble the smartest people I can think of or reach out to to carry that conversation, and that's exactly what I've done today. Please give my panel a round of applause. Welcome. All right, guys, Jay Martin here, CEO of Cambridge House, and I'm joined right now by Kevin Keogh, the CEO and president of Evergold Corp. Kevin, how are you? Oh, not bad, Jay. It's uh, good to be back here. Good to see you in Squamish there as well. I have a daughter there. Right on. Yeah, she's in a good place. We love it up here. Um, I'm excited to get this story in front of our audience and do a bit of a dive behind the kimono. So before we kick it off, what I'd like to do, Kevin, is just let you give us sort of the 30,000 foot view. Um, quick and dirty, what is Evergold Corp? Yeah, we explore for metals, uh, gold and silver and copper, I suppose, but gold and silver primarily. And to date, we've been focused on BC and Northern BC in particular, although we picked up a property in, in Nevada not long ago. Um, so we, we are a pretty new company, just launched late in 2019. I had our first phase programs on two properties in Northern BC last summer, Snowball and Golden Line. And they got us, I think uh, we had some major accomplishments, but we didn't quite get there in terms of uh, blowing open these discoveries. We did achieve a discovery, especially at Snowball. Uh, the the near-term excitement is really all about what could come out of Snowball and Golden Line this summer based on the work that we did last summer. It's quite exciting, and I'll walk you through that. Yeah, I'm excited to dive into that. And that was the story of 2020. It was it was those two projects, Snowball and Golden Lion, you know, two discoveries, essentially. So before we get into the future, Kevin, walk my audience through what you guys uncovered last year. Yeah, well, at Snowball, we delivered a discovery of a high grade gold silver vein system at the highest elevations on Pyramid Peak. And uh, it's very similar in character to the bulk of the historical discoveries in the Golden Triangle, for which the Golden Triangle was really known. It was known for its very high grade uh, gold silver discoveries in the past, uh, deposits like SK, Bruce Jack, the new mine, for example. In recent years, uh, the Golden Triangles also emerged uh, as a hotspot for massive scale porphyry style gold copper systems. But what we have at Snowball is a brand new high grade gold system that is there for us to unfold as a discovery of potentially significant scale. And at Golden Line, it's a bit of a different beast. It's similar in character. It's epithermal style. So it's basically potentially high grade uh, gold silver. But it so happens that we actually have a very large um, low grade envelope of gold and silver over there sitting on surface and within it, higher grade uh, zone. So the excitement at, Co at Golden Line is really about what we think is just below where all the drilling has taken place so far. So those are our focus properties at the minute, Golden okay. Line and Snowball. Yeah, yeah, you've definitely cherry picked your jurisdictions well. You know, we look at like Northern BC where you're at, recently picked up a property in Nevada. Now, you've got a lot of experience in the Golden Triangle. Recently, more recently, you were the CEO of GT Gold Corp. Um, so was that familiarity why you stuck in the jurisdiction that you're at? You know, the geology, you've got the network. How much did that factor into your decision making? Oh, very much so, uh, Jay. That's obviously in this business, it's not just about having great ideas or, or a good head office team, shall we say. You also need to have a network on the ground of people, service providers, that you can tap into to get the work done in a timely way, because I can tell you it's busy up there. It has been for the last couple of years. And it's not easy to get people, for example, you want to get some geophysics done, you know, to prep your, to fine tune your drill targeting. Um, you can't get them just like that. You have to have the network. So we have that. Uh, Charlie Gray, my partner, has been established in BC for a long, long time. Did a lot of the work early on at Bruce Jack. And yes, we've had some tremendous success at uh, GT Gold. 
So elements of all those teams have been redeployed for the Evergold effort. Got it. Got it. Okay. Now, are you seeing more sensitivity from shareholders because you've been in the game a long time prior to GT with some majors like Anglo, American, uh, De Beers. And so you've seen quite the spectrum of shareholder risk tolerance, I would say. And Mm -hmm. when I look at your jurisdictions today, well, one of the reasons I like Evergold is the optionality in favorable gold jurisdictions, right? We're talking BC and Nevada, Nevada, you know, arguably the the world's best uh, gold jurisdiction. Um, Are you seeing increased sensitivity from shareholders and junior mining investors today when they look at more risky jurisdictions? Are they more likely to stay in predictable environments than they used to be? I don't know. Uh, People, you know, investors generally have a rather short attention span. I find, you know, a lot of what's happened in the past tends to to reoccur. So uh, going back over the last generation or two, there have been cycles where people got madly enthusiastic about prospects in Africa, for example, or Southeast Asia. Um, There were major outlays of capital to find and develop major discoveries in some of those areas. And there's always, it seems that something always occurs to take the bloom off the rose with many of those other jurisdictions. Usually it's got something to do with corruption. Mm. People scoop your deposit or your discovery once you've achieved it and built it out they come in and squeeze you out of the picture Uh, that's a rule of law thing right if you don't have confidence in the in the courts to give you justice in any of those jurisdictions then you can be screwed and um, i think what that's one thing people keep coming back to the us and canada and a few other select jurisdictions because they know that they can get satisfaction from the courts and whatever they find isn't necessarily going to be scooped from them, you know, generally speaking. So um, people, investors are certainly keen again right now on all of these mineral exploration stories. As you know, not just gold and silver, but all the green metals and so on and so forth. Yeah. Good to see. I I can tell you just a few years ago, of course, 2012, 13, 14, it it was tough to raise any money at all for the kind of deposits or prospects that people at the minute are raising all kinds of money for. You couldn't give them away. Now you can you can raise millions and millions. So yeah, yeah. We're seeing a renewal of the cycle, but we've seen it before. Yeah, we have. It's amazing how that tide shifts with such energy, you know, I asked the jurisdiction question because I find myself uh, thinking more that way. I just feel like there's more wild cards on the table today than there maybe ever has been, right? We're running a money policy game we never ran before and there's a lot, a lot of unknowns. And so, you know, junior mining's risky enough. If you can control the political factors, I would recommend you do that. So anyways, that's, that's where that question came from. Thanks for sharing. So I want to get back to Snowball and Golden Lion. You guys were busy in 2020, but you're setting up for an even busier 2021. Um, programs are ready to go within probably 30 days here. So talk to me yes. about what investors can look forward to. Yes, the thing about both our phase one projects last year was that we didn't quite get there. We didn't generate the kind of blowout results that the market always hopes to see, you know, and and in our business, if you get them, you can be assured you're going to move much higher, faster. We got up last year to something like 90, 95 cents, you know, on the anticipation of what was to come. Um, But in contrast to GT Gold back in 2017, when we managed to deliver two phases in our first summer and we achieved a significant discovery in the first phase and the second phase, Saddle North and Saddle Saddle South followed by Saddle North. In contrast to that situation, with Evergold last summer, we only got one phase of work in. And there were a number of reasons for it, timing, et cetera. we had hoped that we'd have blowout results and the results weren't there to really drive us up and raise more money easily. So uh, we got to a point where we really delivered that was important at Saddle, at Snowball, for example, last summer was the discovery I talked about before. Mm-hmm. We've now identified 
the so-called sweet spot within this broad mineralized zone. At Snowball, we have the vein system. We think it's kind of occupying a structural feature that has a lot of strike length and width to it. But within that, you're always hunting for the real sweet spot. We think we found it after the drilling wrapped up. We finished up last summer in about mid-August at Snowball. Okay. And uh, did a lot of trenching and sampling just beyond where we're able to, to reach with the drill. We were trying to reach with the drill, but it was tough drilling from where we were situated. And um, we've got really high-grade arsenopyrite rich um, material in outcrop surrounded by disseminated style in the wall rocks, which means we have the potential to deliver much better widths and grades this summer. We had the grades, we didn't have the widths last summer. So okay. um, here, we're going to focus on that at Snowball. And over at Golden Line, the really significant thing, it followed a very similar um, pathway there as Snowball, i.e. we we did the drilling, we did a lot of geophysics, and it was not until shortly after the drilling wrapped up in early September that we were able to define a really sweet looking chargeability target, which is just below where all the historical drilling has taken place. So it appears that the better part of the system is just below this large blob of low grade gold silver that extends along strike. So that's going to be the immediate target for the next phase. And in an ideal, in an ideal world, we would have done this work last season in the phase, second phase of work that we never got to. Right. We're really trying to do now what we had hoped to do last year. Well, lots of super unique challenges last year. Let's let's be honest about we that. Did, yeah. Okay, but you guys are cashed up now. Uh, eight million in the treasury yeah. as of February. You guys raised eight million. So, talk to me a little yes. bit about the scale of this exploration program, budget, um, expected meters, all of the stuff. Yes, and um, the scale of the next phase of work at both Snowball and Golden Line is going to be very similar to the phase one scale last year. So, last year was about two and a half, three thousand meters on both those projects. So, each had two and a half to three thousand meters. On phase two at Snowball this summer, we're planning about the same two and a half, two to two and a half thousand as our first follow up to last year's work. And at Golden Line, it's a little more, about two and a half thousand meters. Um, that's going to cost us something like a million and a half dollars at Snowball, about two million at Golden Line. We had the camp already set up at Golden Line because things we were really encouraged last year. We just left the camp there over winter mm. so we can get going much earlier this year. Um, and then we have a lot of cash in reserve. We can expand both those drill programs uh, depending on results. Okay. I might add, Jay, it's at Golden Line, we're also going to do some more geophysics um, as well as sampling. Golden Line's a much larger property physically. Snowball is like a really nice cherry there where we have a very precise focus. Snowball is mainly about vertical relief. We've got a lot of dimensional, dimensionality in the vertical sense. Um, Golden Line is a long strike and to depth. So, Okay. Okay. Got it. Now... Um, and you're also working right now on one of your third, well, a third property of yours, Rockland, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, we picked that up, uh, the Rockland, Nevada property. It's in the Walker Lane Belt. That's kind of uh, about an hour south south of Yarrington. So it's in the west of the state. And it's a, a very, it's, it's known for its high grade epithermal plays there. You know, Barrick and those guys, uh, are largely focused on the Carlin trend. It's kind of central to the state. Uh, Walker, the Walker Lane was maybe uh, the longer known trend, um, but it's re-emerging just now as a kind of good place to be. Uh, BlackRock and a bunch of other companies are, are busy in that belt now. So we picked up a, it's very similar in style to Snowball and Golden Line. It's an epithermal system and in the cowboy days, 
Uh, there was a very high grade but small gold silver producer on the west side of the property. Um, what we're really interested in and excited by the potential for is actually the east side of the property where we have a, a gold silver system at the thermal that's got the tr similar trace elements that you, the, the kind of trace element flavor that you expect from the halo over these typical high grade epithermal systems like Midas and the sleeper mine down in Nevada, usually you've got some zone above or lateral to the core of the system. And it's carrying these trace elements and some gold and silver. But what you're really looking for is the sweet spot. They, the, they call it bonanza zone down there in Nevada. We don't use that term up here so much, but down there they do. Um, so we're looking for the boiling zone, right? There's several hundred meters usually of ideal uh, zone for the precipitation of gold or silver, dependent on temperature, pressure, et cetera, below these halos. And it's never been drilled. So at Rockland BHP actually drilled this zone. It's not sitting right on surface. It's a bit deeper, about 100 meters down. It's actually over 800 meters long, 200 meters wide and open. This broad, they've even modeled it with leapfrog, but no one's ever drilled below it. And within the broad halo, there's genuine high grade material, structurally focused, you know, with breach zones around it at lower, lower grades. So we can target below the halo. Um, and that's our focus there is really, it's going to be all about the high grade potential in this untouched, deeper epithermal system. Okay. Okay. Now, you know, we haven't touched on Holy Cross or Spanish Lake, your other two properties. Um, before I kind of wrap it up with any trigger points we should look forward to, anything you want to add in on, on these two, Kevin? Sure. Um, you know, we remain Holy Cross. I don't talk about much simply because I don't want to distract the market too much. Uh, we do have a focus. We always have had. But Holy Cross is going to see some work this year. The reason it's southwest of Prince George, and a lot of your listeners are probably familiar with uh, what used to be New Gold's uh, Blackwater deposit, right? Um, it's an intrusion-centered system. Um, what we may have something similar. It's in the same general neck of the woods. It's not a closeology thing, but uh, we're about 60 kilometers north. But it's a similar thing. And it's never been drilled. There's a... a broad area of uh, geochemistry, gold and copper, um, that seems to be leaking up from an intrusion, which we can see in the geophysics, the regional geophysics below it, and um, never drilled. So we think there's a good opportunity to do some detailed IP there. We're going to try to identify structures below what appears to be a cap, peritic cap, you know, solidification, Kind of dead stuff on surface it's really down there a little bit below so we're going to do that this summer okay that set that property up for drilling got it um, and we could drill holy cross in the winter time it's much more moderate topography there so we'll see how that goes and spanish lake i think i'll mention to your viewers and all that at spanish lake we actually have a substantive gold zone in place that's been drilled back in 2011 when the wheels were falling off the market again. Um, a company spent over a million bucks putting in eight or 10 drill holes. Every hole hit sub-economic sub but long intercepts of sediment-hosted gold, very similar to what they have at the, at the Spanish Mountain Gold, which is eight kilometers a long strike. It's, it's identical alteration and deposit style to what they are to hope to develop a mine. And you may know Jim Rogers of, you know, George Soros fame. Of course. Uh, owns, he owns part of Spanish Mountain Gold, right? Um, anyway, it, it's all about, I think that's a very price sensitive deposit that they're hoping to open pit there. But we actually have pretty much the same thing. And the upside at Spanish Lake, 
is simply that the previous drilling in 2011 appears the best of it, the best results are on the edge of their, their drilling fence. So you could easily argue that they're just starting to test into something better. And this coverage is a broad area. So we're going to do more work there, including IP to set it up for drilling as well this summer. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So what we can look forward to, we're doing some field work in Nevada at the Rockland property. We've got bigger mm -hmm. programs occurring at, uh, at Golden Lion and Snowball kicking off in a matter of weeks, right away in June. And then we've got some optionality, right, with Holy Cross and Spanish Lake. And I can speculate that depending on what you find, you know, Snowball and Golden Lion, that will determine whether or not you decide to drill um, Holy Cross in the winter. And we can wait and see on that one. So, um, you know, enough cash in the treasury to complete all the programs that we discussed, correct? You won't be going back to the market. You've got enough to get to work. That's right. We have everything we need to fully execute the next phase of work on, on all the properties at the current time, everything, and to have a reserve of over $2 million. Now, if we, to give you an idea of what could happen, um, going back, another a good analogy again is the saddle discovery in 2017. We set out to drill 4,800 meters of drilling with the first phase. 4,800, and uh, we ended up at over 18,000. Oh, wow. Because of the timing. So we did the first days and we hit and we got a strong, strong encouragement. And we were able to raise money, right? Even though we had basically run the treasury dry, we were able to raise money midsummer and execute a phase two, which carried us right out to the middle of October. It was really phase two that really opened it up big time. So, you know, we didn't get there last year, as I said before, but if we really get successful at either Snowball or Golden Line or Touchwood both, yeah. uh, we'll certainly scale the programs up considerably, in which case, if we really are having big success, we'd need more money for the next phases of scaled up work. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, good reason to raise cash. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. And um, cap table, quick highlights. You guys are about 10% insider owned, strong retail, yes. owner, but about 30% held by institutions, correct? Yes, that's right. We have a good uh, mix of uh, shareholders. We've had institutional involvement since we were private, actually, the plethora of precious metals guys, you may know out of uh, Holland there. Uh, they've been with us since 2017. Um, Are those relationships that you brought from your background with GT? Some of them, yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Plethora was a very early supporter there too. And Sprott and some of the, now that's not Eric Sprott directly. It's the other Sprott, Jason Mayer, his side, right? And uh, we have, but we, it's a really good group we have there. Um, you know, Craig Pop Porter, formerly of Front Street, and he's now with uh, Backer Wealth, Maple right. Funds, and Dennis De Silva. Those three personally guided the investment into us, and they've come in a couple of times now. And um, so, yeah, I've been very happy with the participation we've had from from the institutional side, but at the minute it remains very much a retail story, obviously for, in terms of the day-to-day -day trading. Okay. Okay. Look, Kevin, thank you for the time and for letting us behind the kimono and giving us a behind the scenes look at what you're up to and what we can look forward to a shareholders some trigger points. We know um, there'll be news flow this summer because you'll have drills in the ground. That's um, right. Okay. We are going to we'll do our darndest to deliver. I think I've mentioned to people I put in money, my more money myself at Christmas at 20 cents. So, you know, our last financing was at pretty much the same price we did the IPO at. Would have liked it to be higher, but um, yeah, we have a our capital structure is still reasonable. If I might add, if we really get strong results, we could see a influx of some serious money coming in from the exercise of warrants. We even saw quite a bit that, of that last summer. We had eight or 900,000 come in just on the early work results we had there. Okay. But we have potential to bring in north of $10 million from that direction alone with real success in the market. So 
Um, we are very well set up right now, and people aren't going to have to wait long for the you know news to start flow. I might add, last year was bad, you know, for the assay situation. Everybody complains about it, but it was pretty bad. In fact, we are still waiting for one hole. But in any event, um, we have a bit of a strategy this year that we're going to try to deploy a, a little, a tiny little drill that gets us real core on some of these shallow prospects that we have, just as a way of generating news flow, perhaps well ahead of the big drills results. Um, because as I've told people, you know, you drill a deep hole, 100, 200 meters, um, typically you process the whole hole and you also wait for all the assays from the entire hole before releasing it, which takes months. But if you have a few short holes, you can process them much faster and get results to the market much faster. So we've got a few, uh, we're doing a little experiment, experimenting this summer to see if we can't um, generate better news flow in the short term than we had last year, notwithstanding how the assay labs perform. Okay. Okay. Okay, got it. Well, Kevin, look, so uh, anyone curious, you can find Evergold, E-V-E-R is the ticker. Uh, Kevin, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. And I'd love to bring you back on maybe late summer, mid-summer for a check-in to uh, get an update on the program. Yeah, I'd love to do that. As always, if you enjoy this content, please hit subscribe. I'd love to have you on the team. And if you wanna take the next step and go a bit deeper with my content, I publish a free weekly newsletter every Friday where I debrief my portfolio. I distill the top lessons I've uncovered from the guests I've had on this show every week. And I talk about sectors and industries that I think are poised to move, areas that I'm looking for opportunity and places that I'm allocating capital. I love writing it, we publish every Friday. The link is right beneath this video. Love to have you join the tribe.